I am Theodros Abeba, a Howard graduate and a senior archivist here at Howard University's renowned Moorlands Pinga Research Center. This year, the center is celebrating its 50th anniversary. And as part of that celebration, we are bringing this special three-part program to you. Our guest is Dr. Michael R. Winston, who is the founding director of Moorland Spingar and served in the position from 1973 to 1983. Dr. Winston's connection to Howard University began 65 years ago when he joined the university as a freshman student, graduating with the class of 1962. He then went on to earn master's and PhD degrees from the University of California at Berkeley. Upon his return to Howard, Dr. Winston held several important positions, including professor, assistant dean, vice president for academic affairs, provost and chief academic officer, and academic counsel to the president. In recognition of his illustrious career and distinguished service, Howard University bestowed upon him an honorary degree in 2019. Dr. Winston is a well-published historian and a remarkable storyteller. We hope you will enjoy this program and learn more about the fascinating legacy of Howard University. Thank you for watching. A conversation with Dr. Michael R. Winston, historian and storyteller, part one. Dr. Winston, it's a true pleasure and honor for me to have this conversation with you. I'll begin my questions with, um, uh, as an alumnus, I would like to ask you, what does Howard University mean to you? And how do you define the essence of Howard University? And what has been the most striking and the most constant quality of our beloved institution? Uh, all of those are questions, Mr. Abebe, that uh, one could write a book about. Um, uh, the essence of Howard University is not readily definable. And um, there are, in my mind, many Howard Universities uh, because of its great uh, diversity and complexity. If you ask a graduate of the medical school uh, what is the essence of Howard University, you will get one kind of answer which will be important. If you ask an engineering graduate, they would have a different one. Uh, and even members of the same class who had the same teachers uh, would have very different uh, responses to that question uh, because so much depends on what a person brings to the university. That has a great deal to do with what they get out of it. So that's true of faculty members, that's true of students. Uh, what Howard University uh, has meant to me uh, is related directly to uh, uh, where I was located in uh, the world as it was. And I was uh, a person on the margins. I was black in a uh, country that thought of itself as a white man's country, uh, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois was once asked about Haiti's problems, because Haiti was very much on the mind of black intellectuals at the time. And there were all sorts of elaborate answers. And Dr. Du Bois said, Haiti's problem is it, it is poor and black in a rich white man's world. Uh, I was on the margins, and American society expected me to stay on the margins and not participate in this society. 
I was born in 1941, and at the time, uh, the world was at war, and the United States was a thoroughly segregated country with a segregated army, uh, with segregated schools, and some people don't understand what segregation was. They think it was just the separation of the races. It was subordination of black people. Uh, what Howard was doing for thousands of us was educating us, preparing us for participation in the society, and motivating us to change the society if we got the message. Some people did not get the message. Uh, in my personal circumstance, uh, which I suppose is relevant because one would not understand my motivation unless uh, these facts were known. Uh, in 1957, my father was laid off from his job. It was a recession. And so what had been my college plans were uh, suddenly exploded because it was obvious that I could not uh, go to college out of town and uh, had no way to afford that. And then I learned about uh, the competitive, National Competitive Scholarship Program at Howard. Dean Alma J. Blackburn had come to my high school in New York City, Stuyvesant High School, to say that uh, Howard had this national program and if one took the test and there was no charge for taking the test, depending on how you performed on that test, you might get a scholarship. Uh, because my plan at the time uh, was to go to the City College of New York because ever since 1847, it had been free to all residents of the city, including black residents. And so that was my plan because the cost was de minimis. Well, uh, the following spring of 1958, uh, it was announced, the high school announced, that uh, Howard University had awarded me a National Competitive Scholarship, which would provide four years of uh, tuition and uh, would pay dormitory rent for four years as long as I maintained uh, uh, an adequate grade point average. And I would be responsible for my uh, meals. And at that time, one could get a meal card for the cafeteria at Howard University. For $30 a month, you got three meals a day for a month. So the way was open for me to attend Howard University. I had no idea, of course, what would happen once I actually got here. I discovered the greatest concentration of talent that I had certainly ever seen, and one that had few equals anywhere, and this was the paradoxical effect of segregation, because uh, we had these eminently qualified people who, who were leaders in their fields, uh, but they could not expect to have the, the available to them the resources of the historically white universities. And uh, although uh, there were about 116 uh, <coughs> Negro colleges, there was only one university, it was Howard, uh, those opportunities there were limited and then many of them were located in places where uh, eminent faculty did not wish to be. So we had this extraordinary amount of talent on the faculty. And then we had an extraordinary amount of talent in the student body uh, because uh, there were students from 50 states and 90 countries at the time. Uh, 
decolonization had begun in Africa and how it was known all over the continent. And so very able students were here. And staff people had come from all over the country to be at Howard University. I had never seen anything like it. I have now been to many countries of the world. I still have not seen anything like Howard University. Uh, I was excited to be here and uh, I received here a very fine education. I also received uh, a focus and a motivation because it was clear from what the president said and many others, this was the president at the time was Dr. Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, that Howard University was founded for the complete liberation of the black people of the world. And he used that term, uh, which used to surprise people, but he uh, was a remarkable man in understanding uh, the underlying unity of oppressed people. And uh, some faculty used to be annoyed at uh, uh, the way he spoke about what we were up to at Howard University because it was nothing in his mind less than full liberation, which then meant that every field of endeavor should be open to us and excellence was the admission ticket. And so there was this paradoxical situation of remarkably high standards applied to people who uh, had been in nearly every case deeply deprived not only of opportunity, but the resources to have their own capacities uh, unleashed. And so that was when I came here as a 17 year old and attended orientation in the chapel and talked to my classmates and uh, heard the faculty speak, I knew I had found uh, the right place. I had not at that time found my right calling because I came to Howard uh, with the idea that I would prepare for medical school. That had been a goal for many years. I went to a science high school. I worked at Beth Israel Hospital uh, uh, in the later part of the day uh, to get some experience. And so I thought that medicine was going to be my career. Uh, and at Howard, I discovered uh, field of history through, it was in my sophomore year that I was advised by an upperclassman, Leroy Stone from Kingston, Jamaica. He said to me, Breeze, <laughs> called everybody Breeze, Breeze, it would be a crime for you to graduate from Howard University and not have a course from Harold Lewis. I said, who is Harold Lewis? He said, well, he is a great teacher of history. It doesn't matter what course you take, just take a course from him. So in my sophomore year, I did take a course from Professor Harold O. Lewis. And after I had been in that class for six weeks or so, I knew that I would never get to medical school. I would completely change my outlook on that and that history was going to be uh, my future. Uh, but that was, that was just one small part of uh, coming to an awareness of what was possible 
for me and this broad swath of people who were uh, my classmates and associates. And quite remarkably, um, despite the dearth of uh, resources, because how it looked great to us for the most part, but there were many things we did not have because the university's funding was inadequate. And what was compensating for that was the dedication of faculty uh, and the persistence of an ideal that what was ever achievable by human beings was achievable by us. And uh, all one had to do was walk across the campus from one end to the other, and it was not that big a campus. It's far smaller than it is now. But one could see the full range of intellectual and professional endeavor. And each charter day when alumni returned and when some alumni were recognized for their postgraduate achievement, you could see what this transformation had been. With people coming in and starting out as freshmen and then maturing, maturing, learning more and more and becoming full-fledged professionals and participating in, in politics, in science, in engineering, in architecture, and so forth. Uh, I regard Howard as uh, uh, the greatest liberating force in my life. And it was, my education was transformative. And one of the reasons that I aspired to be a faculty member was that I wanted to uh, continue that tradition. So that's a very long way to answer just one part of that, of that question. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Winston. Let me stay on that period of uh, you as a student at Howard. Uh, you graduated with class of 1962. Um, and I n noticed that your student years were eventful. Uh, you were involved in student government and uh, you uh, had like project awareness. Uh, and I just want to ask you about your uh, involvement in student government and how some of the programs that uh, you organized came about, uh, including the debate between Mr. Malcolm X and Mr. Bayard Rustin. Well, I, I had never given a thought <coughs> to student government until I came to Howard. And uh, in the College of Liberal, each, each of the colleges had their own student government, uh, and there was no unified student body uh, government. It was each, each school and college had their own student council. And the, the College of Liberal Arts had a very active uh, student council and uh, some very able students uh, were involved in that as well as the, the newspaper, The Hilltop. And uh, I was frankly inspired by those uh, student leaders. Um, and so when I ran and then won the post of president of the student council, uh, I thought some changes were uh, important to make. And one of them was uh, to have students at the university more involved in current affairs. Um, this was a global development. Students were active in liberation movements around the world. 
Uh, there were student unions in many countries. We did not have quite that phenomenon uh, in the United States. Um, and our student governments in American colleges and universities tended to be much less political than in other countries. But I thought that uh, there was uh, a very heavy dose of uh, social life in uh, our situation at Howard and too little in terms of uh, uh, what was going on in the larger world. And so that's how the name came. We, we had a number of projects. Project Awareness was, was one. Um, but I thought what we needed to do was to have a series of debates. And uh, this was going to be called Project Awareness to make uh, the student body aware of current developments. And rather than have uh, uh, simply outstanding speakers give lectures, uh, there would be debates that would force the issues uh, into exposure. Uh, well, and there was a, a committee of students that <laughs> did the lineup of speakers. And uh, uh, it was suggested that uh, Malcolm X would be one, and then Bayard Rustin would be his opponent in that debate. And when we sent forward the uh, names for approval by the university administration, uh, the dean of students, Dr. Alma J. Blackburn, rejected uh, <coughs> Uh, those speakers. And so I then made an appointment to see President Nabrit to object. And I uh, went to the President's office and uh, I said to him, Dean Blackburn has said that if Mr. X spoke at Howard, there would be surging mobs of students rushing through the gates. I said, Dr. Nabrit, I never thought I would hear at Howard University anyone claim that Howard University students were inferior to white students. He was smoking a big cigar. He smoked Churchill cigars like that. And then he squinted at me. What do you mean? I said, well, Mr. X, has spoken at New England colleges. He's spoken at Ivy League institutions. He's uh, spoken at white state institutions. There were no mobs. I said, we are deliberately saying that this should be a debate so that Howard students would hear Mr. X's point of view. And the opposite point of view was Mr. Rustin's, who was an ardent integrationist and, pa and pacifist. Uh, now, my speech to Dr. Nabert had was loaded. Uh, I knew that he was uh, an eminent civil rights lawyer. He would get the civil liberties aspect of that right away. He would also get the, the point I was making. So he took a long drag on his cigar, and then he leaned forward at his desk and said, all right, but you, I will never forget this, 160 years ago, yeah. you will be responsible for anything that goes wrong, any disorder. I will not be there, but you will be responsible. Uh, so, because this was the first of the project awareness debates. The other uh, programs included on thermonuclear war with 
Herman Kahn, who was an advocate for nuclear weapons, and Norman Thomas, the former socialist candidate for president of the United States, was on the other side. He was a pacifist, and he was anti-war, and he was anti-nuclear weapons. Uh, the debates covered the range of international relations and national issues. The one that is remembered is Malcolm X because uh, no one expected Malcolm X to be given a place to speak at Howard uh, since he was a prominent advocate of what he calls separation. Uh, I was denounced in class by Dr. Rayford W. Logan, who was, I was taking his course at the time, and he said, a member of this class has invited an ardent segregationist to come to speak at Howard University. And he and many other faculty members announced that they would not go to hear anything like that, all right? because that's not what Howard University represented. Uh, to say the least, it was a very touchy situation. And I was aware that it could all backfire. Uh, not too long before this debate, Life magazine, which at the time had the largest circulation in the United States, and it was a big photo format, had run a series of pictures on what they called the black Muslims. And uh, these photographs showed hundreds of people uh, uh, in the black Muslim dress. So I knew there was the possibility that uh, there would be a photograph taken that was like that, that would then misrepresent Howard University. So I had said to Mr. Malcolm X, as we were discussing the arrangements, that uh, this event was going to be for Howard University students. Uh, and so uh, we expected we were able to accommodate him, uh, but not his followers. He agreed to that. Uh, we had made very careful arrangements the format was we always had a dinner for the two speakers, and we would invite faculty members in relevant fields to have dinner with us, some students, and the speakers. Uh, so we were, we had made those arrangements, and I had arranged with the cafeteria be sure that no pork was used in the preparation of any of the food and so on and so on. And that was, uh, all of those details were taken care of. The debate was scheduled for the evening. In the early afternoon, the vice president of the student council, my very good friend, Edward Lancelot Miles of Trinidad, was called by a friend of his in Harlem to say that there were many buses leaving Temple Number no. 7, which was the Muslim temple in Harlem, to go to Howard University. Mm -hmm. So exactly what I had feared was about oh. to happen. So we set up a calling operation uh, in the student council offices and other places where students had access to phones and called all over the campus to say, be at Crampton Auditorium early. Mm -hmm. 
and fill up every seat. Uh, the evening came, uh, Mr. X and his Fruit of Islam bodyguards came with him. Uh, they were all in black suits, white shirts, and bow ties, straight as a die. Uh, another difficulty we had had was the no student was going to be the moderator for all of these debates. We were going to use a faculty member. I went from faculty member to faculty member asking them to be moderators. And I was not the moderator, I just introduced the moderator. So finally, I went to Professor Emmett E. Dorsey, who was head of the political science department, and asked him uh, if he would. Uh, and he said, what's going on? I told him the story. I have asked many faculty if they would uh, moderate this debate, and they say they refused to be on the same platform with Mr. X. He said, that's nonsense. Uh, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, Professor Dorsey was a well-known uh, political theorist and had been a Marxist, and, uh, but, and he didn't believe in a thing that Mr. X believed in. However, uh, he said he would moderate it. So he was at this dinner. So you, if you can picture this dinner, uh, we used uh, uh, a private space in uh, uh, Baldwin Hall uh, that was used for trustee dinners and we, was able to, we were able to get that space. Uh, so <coughs> the first surprise was Mr. X refused to eat any of the food and the bodyguards just stood around the room in silence. And Professor Dorsey was known for a remarkable vocabulary and uh, was um, very uh, convoluted in some of his formulations. So at one point he said, uh, now Mr. X, then he had this long question. Malcolm X looked at him. He said, well, you know, uh, Professor, you have to break that down because uh, I, I, I didn't go to college and so on. And, and that, that dialogue, Mr. X won that dialogue because it, 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 what, that wasn't good. Not too long after that exchange, one of the Fruit of Islam staff came and whispered into Mr. X's ear, and his, his face changed. A cloud came across his face. And he said, Mr. Winston, uh, I, I'm told that, that uh, our, our, our people can't get in. I said, in all innocence, <laughs> Mr. X, I had indicated that this was a major event and uh, mm. we have thousands of students here and there are only 1,500 seats in Crampton Auditorium. And so the students have come. Mm. Uh, but uh, we, can, we can accommodate uh, your people. They were in buses all along 6th Street. So they parked in front of Crampton Auditorium. And Mr. Ralph Dines, who was uh, in charge of technical matters in Crampton Auditorium, I had alerted Mr. Dines in advance, and they had speakers on cables that came out from the auditorium to the buses. And so these people who had come from New York to see the debate, heard the debate, but they did not see it, oh. and we didn't. And there were no, uh, there was no opportunity for this uh, Life magazine kind of situation that Howard University was now a black Muslim institution. Okay. Uh, 
So we proceeded with the debate, and uh, most people, I think, who were there thought that Mr. X had the better uh, result uh, because um, he was talking about the liberation of black people and he was talking about uh, the white man and what the white man has done and so on and so forth and that he didn't see any reason to be peaceful about it and so on. And Mr. Rustin was a very experienced person but he had a high-pitched voice and um, an accent that some people would think was a, uh, a theatrical British voice. And so the affect was quite different. Uh, it was almost standard civil rights language that he used, but um, he was on the margins of that movement too. Uh, so it, that was not that effective. But uh, in many ways, the debate of 1961 was significant because it presaged uh, the student movement as it would explode in the next few years. At the time, that was not happening in this area. Uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, was active, and the Greensboro sit-in was 1960, but that had just started. Howard's involvement in it was with the Nonviolent Action Group, NAG, which uh, had sit-ins in Virginia, and they used to leave the campus every weekend. Students would get buses and uh, go there, and the student council provided some of the funds for NAG's buses, even though it was, that was not a student council activity. But uh, the principle had been established that there would be no uh, preemptive censorship of speakers. And uh, so that was, not, that was not an issue in the future student movement of 1967-68. Um, so that's a, a long way to say that that photograph is on the internet and well known, but there was more to it going on because again, the symbolic importance of Howard University was on the line and Mr. Malcolm X wanted to exploit it for his purposes and he had no concern with Howard University's vulnerabilities in that because uh, about 60% of the operating budget of the university came from the Congress and white Southern congressmen were not going to be friendly because we had been uh, host to Mr. X and that we would be quickly uh, identified with those ideas. And 100% uh, of the construction budget came from the federal government. And so I had to be mindful of the importance of the debate intellectually important for the students to be informed, and then not to be uh, placing the university in some kind of jeopardy because of what we were pursuing. Mm -hmm. uh, now, again, in personal terms, for me to have had that experience uh, that early in my life, gave me a sense of how complicated matters affecting Howard University are, how complicated 
racial issues are in the United States and what it means to have a successful university in this country that represents what Howard represents. Hmm. And at the same time, to have students of all races here, all colors here, all religions here, and with the freedom to pursue ideas. And um, because we have, we have radical students, conservative students, indifferent students, it's the same thing with faculty. And that's important for uh, an institution committed to two things, ideas, truth, and action which is what part of the service thing is about, okay? Hmm. And um, I can stop there because that was only a part of a part of a question. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's a very, very interesting story. I, I always wanted to know about that debate and thank you, Dr. Winston, for telling us, for sharing that story. Did you get a chance to speak with uh, President Nebrit after that? And what was the media's reaction? to the debate? Actually, the, there, there wasn't much uh, media coverage. I don't, mm. I, I don't remember, frankly, because uh, I was so relieved that we, didn't, we, we did not have it, any issues. That, that, that evening aged me. Mm. Uh, Dr. Nabret and I developed a very close relationship uh, then until the end, until the, all the way to the end of his life, uh, I became a, a good uh, personal and family friend. Uh, because again, he understood, he was playing a role as president, he had to protect the institution, and if necessary, he was gonna shut me down. <laughs> uh, and I knew that. And then I had a role to play as uh, a student leader, I, I took that seriously. And um, it was clear to me that universities were going to be, uh, and colleges of course, points of action. I wasn't any clearer than that at the time. But again, it, all over the country in the 60s, this is just later 60s, this is the early 60s, but I was uh, uh, aware of what the National Student Association had been doing. Uh, I made arrangements for the entire student council to go to the National Student Association meeting, which that year was in Madison, Wisconsin, at the University of Wisconsin. And of course, there were student leaders from universities all over the United States. And uh, a Howard student, Timothy L. Jenkins of the class of 1960, was a leader in the NSA. And as a matter of fact, had uh, expected to be able to be uh, international affairs vice president, that was blocked, and he became national affairs vice president. And as it happened, that placed him in a critical position uh, because student activists across the country were getting involved in the civil rights movement. And, uh, and he was absolutely pivotal in bringing NSA support to SNCC. He had been active in SNCC and uh, uh, again, you could see Howard University exerting leadership in places and, and in ways that were just largely not understood. And uh, to this day, uh, Timothy Jenkins's role is not well known, uh, but 
the the changes that came about as a result of student activism across the country uh, were very important. When you were a student, a student here at Howard, um, there were many members of the faculty who, uh, who were really uh, very impressive and uh, who achieved a whole lot uh, at the national and international level. And um, you mentioned uh, Professor Dorsey earlier, and you also mentioned uh, Professor Logan, Wafer Logan, with whom you had uh, a very close relationship. Um, uh, you collaborated on, on some projects with him. Um, I mention him because we use uh, his book uh, about Howard University, the history of Howard University, and uh, also the book by uh, uh, Professor Dyson. Uh, we use those books as uh, uh, very important reference materials. And you worked with uh, Professor Logan on, on uh, his book. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I should say first that uh, Professor Logan and I uh, became uh, colleagues and very good friends much later. As a student, I had a very different attitude about him. Uh, I only took one course from him, uh, and that was required of all history majors. He taught the uh, course uh, called History of the Negro in the United States. And every major in history at Howard had to take one of the two semesters. And uh, I did not find him an engaging teacher at all. Uh, uh, his method, I thought, was very old fashioned. He lectured. Uh, there was hardly any class discussion, and um, he wanted you to learn a rather limited list of issues. He wanted you to learn those thoroughly, but what you were interested in was peripheral, and he had a, a script that he stuck to. Uh, so I just took that one course. Um, and this is entirely presumptuous to say, but I thought he had uh, the wrong approach to the history of the university. Uh, and that is related, I think, to his training. Professor Logan was trained as a diplomatic historian. And in diplomatic history, you rely overwhelmingly on archival documents because you're dealing with governments. And governments have archives, and so you can document uh, them in a very particular way. Universities, however, have histories that are far harder to capture. Now, Dr. Logan thought, and the other the other point was that in doing diplomatic history, your principal concern is with power and the resolution of power conflicts internationally. So for him, the key documents, the important documentation was the records of the Board of Trustees. And so the major effort, he was given access. There was great resistance at first to giving him access to the minutes of the Board of Trustees. But he insisted, and President Nabrit, who had been secretary of the university, so was perfectly familiar with all of those records, uh, said yes, and so he would go to the office of the secretary of the board of trustees 
for months to go over the minutes. And he took meticulous notes on all of the actions of the board. So Howard University, the first hundred years by Rayford W. Logan, is essentially the history of the actions of the Board of Trustees. Mm -hmm. That does not get to the significance of Howard University, the meaning of those actions. It doesn't say very much about the faculty. It doesn't say very much about the students. And such material as relates to those subjects and those entities that in the history came about after big fights with a committee that the president had appointed. Uh, it was a committee on the history of the university. And we, Dr. Charles Thompson, the dean of the graduate school and founder of the Journal of Negro Education and others were on it. And they wanted more material about the life of the university, not to, what, just the Board of Trustees. So the book represented that kind of compromise. Uh, and he refused to interview uh, faculty, students, or alumni who had been involved. And so as you read it, it's about disputes that reach the level of the board. Yeah. Uh, and he had very complicated relationships with Dr. Mordecai Johnson and some other people. And those disputes uh, get into, to take up a dis proportionate amount of space. Uh, now, Dr. Nabert had made a mistake in commissioning the history because what he said to me in later years was, I wanted a document to present to the appropriations committees of the Congress to say this is what Howard University has achieved in 100 years. Now, if he had said to Dr. Logan, this is what I want, Dr. Logan would not have accepted the commission because as far as he was concerned, that's dictated history mm -hmm. and that is potted history. That's not, uh, that's not the important thing. But of course, to the president of the university, the important thing was to say, this is what has been accomplished since the chartering of the institution, two completely different objectives. Dr. Logan, to my knowledge, also did not read the history of other institutions. And why would that be important? Because you cannot determine what was important and significant about Howard unless you have a clear picture of the rest of American higher education at the time. Because uh, on the single question of the admission of women, the first thing people think about it in connection with Howard is race. But in the education of women, Howard University is one of the great pioneers among universities. Now there were women's colleges who started out as seminaries for women. But General Howard and the founders admitted women to every school and college at the beginning. And that had a bit, very big impact in the professional schools. So if you go through Daniel Smith Lamb's history of the Howard University Medical Department, you see a significant number of white men and particularly white women. Why? Were these integrationists? No. No other medical school in multiple state jurisdictions around this, around Washington, D.C., would not admit women. Georgetown Medical School did not admit women. George Washington Medical School did not admit women. 
University of Virginia didn't admit women to medical school. They didn't admit women to law school. So for many years, about 40 years, the overwhelming number of white women practicing law or medicine were Howard graduates. Uh, and some interesting things happened. Uh, Emma Gillette, who was a class of a white woman who graduated in the Howard University School of Law class of 1884, uh, she and another white woman who had not attended Howard founded the Washington College of Law, which was for women, but they excluded black women, okay? And that law school became the American University School of Law, Washington College of Law, which later admitted men and black women. Uh, the, the Howard University College of Medicine was regarded by the American Medical Association as an unethical medical school because it had women on the faculty of the College of Medicine from the very beginning. Uh, now, what does that represent? Okay. It re represents a conception of educational democracy and real opportunity that other institutions did not address. The Harvard Law School did not admit women until after World War II, right? The medical school did not admit women. That was a very fine medical school, a very fine law school. But if you were a white woman, you could not go because you were a woman. So people came to Howard. There were different things going on there. The same thing in the hospital. Okay? The rest of the country had the superstition you could not have white doctors, black doctors, white patients, and black patients in the same place. But they did it at Friedman's Hospital and Howard University College of Medicine. Hmm. Now, was that, was, was that just all just easy? No, because people bring their attitudes with them. They bring their expectations and so forth. But the intent of Howard University for its first 40 years was to prove that you could have American institutions and communities that were not racially segregated. So General Howard had four schools and colleges to deal with. He had two white deans and he had two black deans. The Board of Trust, all of the founders were white men, every one of them. But General Howard insisted on black trustees. And so the first two black trustees were Frederick Douglass and Henry Highland Garnett, the two most prominent black abolitionists. Two black deans, John Mercer Langston of the law school, founding dean of the law school, and John Bunyan Reeve, who was the first dean of the School of Religion. Now that was such an, obs Dean Reeve was so obscure. He was dean for five years and he was a very prominent clergyman in his time. He was a graduate of the Union Theological Seminary in New York City. But when I said to Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays, who had been dean of the School of Religion at Howard, from 1934 to 1940. He said, Dr. Winston, that can't be right. I said, Dr. Mays, Dean Reeve was simply erased. He said, everyone said I was the first Negro Dean of the School of Religion. I said, you were the second. <laughs> uh, again, now, was that, a, a universal attitude among the white trustees? No. Many of those trustees thought General Howard uh, was an enthusiast 
and was too far ahead of everybody else. And uh, that the institution would have impossible difficulties to deal with because the country wasn't ready for that. And ready or not, that's what he was prepared to do. And so when they laid out the campus, as you have seen from the charts, uh, when they first bought the 150 acres or so, I think it's actually 149 something, uh, they reserved the center part of it for the, what they called the campus, and then around it were building lots that they sold to the public. And many of the founders and faculty bought the lots and then built houses. And so there on the th one of the three highest hills in Washington, D.C., you had this community. These are Howard people. And they lived, their children, the, the, many of the white trustees had children who went to school because we had an elementary school on the campus, we had a high school on the campus, and we had the college, and we had the graduate and professional schools. And they were here. If that could be done, then there was something profoundly wrong with the laws of the United States that required segregation. And so uh, the opposition to Howard was not just because people were anti-black. They were against any demonstration that all of this segregation effort was nonsense. And this, this was an exercise in power and enforced ignorance, enforced poverty, enforced maldistribution of resources. So to me, the history of Howard University properly understood is that this was an experiment in democracy, social democracy, educational democracy. It was human equality operating in real live time. And remember that the people we're talking about had just come out of slavery. And the institution was designed to accommodate that. We're going to do the impossible. We're going to have the highest academic standards for people who were not admitted to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And so we had it all here on this campus, from kindergarten to medical school. And uh, there were many efforts to break that up because one of the reasons the institution could not get accredited for many years was that the accrediting agencies said, you have too much pre-collegiate education there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was another excuse to try to handicap this successful experiment. Um, because the way it worked, they placed you where you needed to be placed. So in those early days of the university, you could have people 30, 40 years old who are still in the elementary stages of an education. There, there wasn't anything fake or flimsy about it. And many people, including black people said, that educational program at Howard University is crazy. Why should former slaves and the children of slaves learn Latin and Greek? The program of the College of Liberal Arts, it was then called the College Department, 
was Latin, Greek, and mathematics. Those, that, that was the main part of the curriculum. Well, it was very simple. That's what college education was for the people who were going to run, the white people who were going to run the country, who went to college, learned Latin, Greek, and mathematics. And so that's what people at Howard were going to learn. They were going to have the same substantive education. And if you look at the early faculty, you will see that they were overwhelmingly graduates of New England colleges where that was the curriculum. And uh, Booker T. Washington and other people who advocated for vocational education said, black people don't need Latin, Greek, and mathematics. And so that was the battle. And um, some of our greatest products, that's, that's what their education was. And so you, equality of preparation implies equality of treatment and capacity to advance in uh, the arts and sciences after that. So it wasn't, it, the curriculum was a problem for many people, including some black people. Uh, the emphasis on uh, pluralism in uh, the diversity of the camp. People talk about diversity now. Howard started with great diversity and it was used against Howard. Um, and one of the things that was charged against Dr. Mordecai Johnson was that he transformed Howard from a diverse institution into a Negro institution. Because there had been equivocation about what kind of place is that? Because it, the question came early, it, it was asked of General Howard, what is that university going to be? Is it going to be a white institution? Is it going to be a black institution? He said it's going to be an American institution. But of course, that's not how people defined America. You defined America by defining black people out of it. And then we came to a point where there were black people who were uncomfortable with white members of the Howard community because this is a black university. Well, what, what about it? And Dr. Johnson's point was not about just something along racial lines. He said, we have got to prove that Negroes are capable of running an institution this complicated. We need to have a Negro dean of the medical school, because there had not been one before his time. Numa Pompilius Garfield Adams was the first black dean of the Howard Medical School. All that time from 1868 until uh, Dean Adams' appointment in the Johnson administration in 1929 uh, had been white dean. And he said, we have to prove that a Negro can be dean of a medical school. And uh, same thing was true about uh, the identity of the Howard Law School. So all of these layers of complexity relate to the layers of complexity of what I have called in print the most sophisticated system of racial domination in the world. The South Africans were primitives compared to white Americans because you have here a constitution that has guarantees, 14th and 15th Amendment, that were ignored, that were made a mockery of by the Supreme Court of the United States. 
uh, you have northern states where they say, we don't, we, we, we don't have any racism here. Well, I was born in New York City, and New York City has been a segregated city as long as it has existed. During antebellum days, it was a major market connected to the slave trade because the brokerages were in New York City and they were pro-Southern for that reason. Uh, the shares in slaves and the cotton brokerages went right through Wall Street. Uh, but they didn't need signs. They did, did not need signs saying this, this, this is a Negro school. You just made sure that's where Negroes lived and you control that. I am past 80 years old and the city of New York has the most racially segregated public school system in the United States, not anywhere in the South, but you do not have any official segregation in New York City schools. You just have segregation. The United States is the only industrialized country in the world where you can predict educational outcomes, health status, death rates, by zip code. And it requires a kind of knowledge to deal with that. That is complex and is the kind of knowledge that has been provided at Howard University for decades. When Charles Hamilton Houston became dean of the law school, and began challenging the foundations of segregation in the country. Some people were puzzled by his interest in the social sciences. Dean Houston understood, if you are going to deal with this system, the social outcomes of the system are sufficient to produce the segregation, but at that time, in the 1930s, they had laws to deal with on top of it. But the North has been self-righteous about uh, statutory segregation. We didn't have any statutory segregation. You know, there are a couple of exceptions. Uh, Delaware, state of Delaware had statutory segregation. And the parts of New Jersey, where southern New Jersey particularly, they had statutory segregation. My wife was born in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and they had segregated public schools in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, a great Howard University faculty member, founder of uh, the drama department and the Howard Players, uh, Montgomery Gregory, left Howard University to go to Atlantic City to become principal of a school there because his Howard faculty salary was so low and he had a large family, he couldn't stay at Howard. But he and Professor Locke uh, were colleagues in promoting drama at Howard. But the salaries were such that uh, he, he went, but he went to, to uh, segregated schools because they had one high school in Atlantic City, which was integrated. Elementary schools were segregated. Uh, but then again, a little factoid clarifies the situation. Yes, black students were admitted to Atlantic City High School, but they could not use the swimming pool. Hmm. All right? They could come, take their courses, graduate, but they could not use the swimming pool. Now, some of the meaning of Howard, what these facts mean, 
you cannot capture in the documents of the Board of Trustees. It's very important to know what the official actions were. But even there, if you're aware of the way institutions work, only certain things get recorded in the Board of Trustees minutes. What's behind the minutes is another matter altogether, what the motivations were. Uh, and you get anomalies. Uh, I'll, I'll give a name to that one, the Abraham Flexner anomaly. Now, as you know, uh, Abraham Flexner was the author of the Flexner Report, which was, uh, in some ways, the salvation of the Howard Medical School, because when the Flexner Report was first commissioned by the Rockefellers, um, the General Education Board, it was the Rockefeller Philanthropy, uh, there were seven medical schools that admitted Negroes. And the Flexner Report indicated that there should be only two, uh, Howard and Meharry, because they, they met Flexner's criteria, and it said that Howard University Medical School was particularly deserving of support because of its uh, connection with the university. Meharry was a freestanding medical school in Nashville <coughs> uh, near Fisk University, but not part of Fisk. And Howard was a university, and it had the preclinical departments and strong chemistry and biology programs. So Howard came out on top in the Flexner Report. And in the 1930s, Mr. Flexner <coughs> was, at the urging of foundations, was placed on the board of trustees at Howard and uh, became chairman of the board. Now, as you know, uh, after Mr. Crampton, Louis C. Crampton of Michigan, was successful as the chairman of the House Committee on Appropriations for getting the charter amended to provide for annual appropriations. By 1930, there was a program for the development of the university by the federal government. First time such a commitment had been made. And uh, this uh, was well funded and uh, it was one of the great achievements of uh, advocates for Howard University. And of course, Mordecai Johnson was president when the charter was amended, although he was, had not been the initiator of that effort. Well, when the, build, the new building program began, uh, the intent was to build a university plant that was equivalent to the best in the country. Uh, there was this problem. In 1929, there was the Wall Street crash, and the Great Depression began soon afterwards. So one of the first major projects after regrading the campus and beginning creating the infrastructure that would support all of these buildings, because the whole, whole place was regraded, re-landscaped, and so on. And there is an elaborate tunnel system under the university. All of that had to be built. And the first buildings to come to light in that, with three women's dormitories. Well, because the Great Depression had occurred, enrollment had dropped drastically because black people were disproportionately affected by the Depression. 
So there were three dormitories. They only had enough students to fill up one of them, which was a scandal. So the university used the space for a number of things. Faculty members lived in there. They had suites and so on and so on, and, that, and it was very quiet. And then Douglas Hall, and of course the, the plan called for a twin of Douglas Hall to be next to it where uh, the Carnegie Building is, and opposite where Lock Hall is, and would be two other buildings, to be four Douglas Halls uh, connected by walkways. Well, uh, we didn't have enough faculty people, we didn't, students. And then the centerpiece of the campus was to be Founders Library, which as you know, uh, had great symbolic importance, but many people don't get the symbolism. It is a copy, though it's bigger, of Independence Hall in Philadelphia to remind people of the Constitution of the United States at the center of the campus. And this is a very substantial building. Mr. Flexner, the chairman of the board, was opposed. He said, that is too big for a colored school. And many white universities don't have anything like that. And the federal government has appropriated $1 million for that building, and we can do, be, do very well with 500,000. That is just a pretentious building, uh, and Howard doesn't need it. Now, Dr. Mordecai Johnson is known as a great orator. Some people call him a preacher and so forth. He had one of the finest minds I have ever encountered. He was shrewd in ways you would not expect a university president to be shrewd. So Dr. Johnson made an appointment to see Mr. Harold L. Ickes, who was the Secretary of the Interior, responsible for the Howard University program. And uh, we were, in quotes, sheltered in the Department of the Interior. Mr. Ickes was a great New Dealer. Uh, and he wanted to know President Johnson's mission for this uh, appointment. And Dr. Johnson said to him, well, he was very sorry to report that he had been ordered, this is his language, he had been ordered by the Board of Trustees to return half of the appropriation. And so Mr. Ickes wondered, why is that? Well, uh, they think it's too big, that that's more library capacity than we need right now. I have been told that Mr. Ickes picked up a big book on his desk, stood up and threw the book down on the floor and said, that's absurd. He said, you don't build a building for now, you build a library for 100 years from now. Howard University will get every dime that has been appropriated. Hmm. Meanwhile, Mr. Flexner's opposition had undermined his position among the trustees. And trustee George W. Crawford of uh, New Haven, Connecticut, who later became corporation counsel in New Haven, he was a graduate of Talladega College in Alabama and of the Yale Law School, and a very well-known person in uh, Negro organizations, a very important part of the NAACP, and he was a Mason, and he was in the Boulay, 
as Mr. Crawford organized a quiet movement to get Mr. Flexner out of the chair, and Flexner resigned from the board. Uh, but it took years for many trustees to approve of these ambitions for Howard that were going to be consistent with what was being built. And there was great pressure. If you notice, uh, that style of architecture was discontinued because there were many people that said, Howard doesn't need buildings like that. Now the backdrop of that, of course, is that public building for Negroes in the United States was designed to look a certain way. So when you looked at nearly every state Negro college, it looked more like a penitentiary than a college. All right? That was deliberate. Just as housing projects in the United States are designed to look bad, to make people ashamed to be housed in them. You go to European cities where they have what they call social housing. I lived in Vienna, Austria, working on my doctoral dissertation, and I walked all over Vienna. And you couldn't tell where the public housing began or ended. It looked like all the rest of the housing, okay? Uh, and Howard University was looking different. Now, at, there were practical problems. When the chemistry building at Howard University opened, it was dedicated by Franklin D. Roosevelt, the President of the United States. Why did he do that? Was he such an enthusiast about education? No. Was he such an enthusiast about Negroes? No. He'd been Secretary of the Navy and uh, Franklin Roosevelt started out as a typical rich white man. His wife was more interested in Negroes and she eventually went on the Board of Trustees. However, Howard University was a very important part of his political program. So there was a national hookup of radio stations all over the United States carrying the dedication of the Howard University Chemistry Building. Why? Because Roosevelt did not interfere with segregation in the solid South, so-called, because white Southern segregationists were a crucial part of the Democratic coalition. So you could always expect the Southern states to vote for him. However, there was that price. But meanwhile, after the Great Migration, Northern and Midwestern cities had substantial Negro populations and they were voting. So he needed the Negro vote in the Northern and Midwestern states. And so what was done for Howard University was to get those votes. And all of that's understandable. But now from an educational point of view, what, what is going on here? When that building went up, it was the largest chemistry building in any university in Washington. It was one of the largest in the country. We had seven faculty members when that building opened. Okay? And so it wasn't an accident that that department grew. Uh, Percy L. Julian, one of the great organic chemistry professors and researchers in the world, became the head of the chemistry department at Howard. And uh, he had been at the University of Vienna. And when the plans were being drawn, he was a consultant on what 
kinds of laboratories were going to go into that building. And they recruited chemists from all over the country. It was not an accident that that was the first department at Howard University to be authorized to offer the PhD degree, which was opposed by a number of people. E. Franklin Frazier, Rayford Logan, and a number of other distinguished professors opposed a PhD program in the chemistry department or in any department. And their reason? Because they said that will reinforce segregation. Because right now, if our students want to get certain kinds of graduate education, they have to go somewhere else. So therefore, we integrate those places. If we offer PhD programs that are equivalent, then that won't happen and we will just be another segregated school. That was their argument. The great advocate for that program was Dr. Charles H. Thompson, the dean of the graduate school, an expert on school segregation and all of that. However, he said if we have an excellent chemistry program, we will produce excellent chemists. Now, you just have to make up your mind what it is. Uh, the head of the department was Professor J. Leon Sharashevsky. He was enthusiastic about it, and they built that program. Uh, now, we don't have the same kinds of issues anymore about, you know, if we have this program or that program, how does that affect the status of legalized segregation. But that was part of their problem. But after World War II, the Congress refused to have any more Georgian architecture that they were going to fund. Nothing looking like Founders Library or Douglas Hall. Right? And so, uh, a stripped down boxy architecture was put there. Yale University had its Gothic campus. Now that, that was ironic because it was an authentic American colonial campus because it existed in colonial times. They tore down the authentic colonial campus to build a Gothic campus. Princeton the same thing. You go to Princeton, you I think you're in England, okay? Because that was their model. Uh, and some of our architects, uh, Hilliard Robinson, who uh, designed a number of buildings on campus, Hilliard Robinson said to me that that architecture is the architecture of the slave master. And he said, uh, we are building modern buildings here that have nothing to do with that. And uh, uh, he was an advocate for the international style. And so when he looked at some buildings, like the College of Fine Arts building, which he designed, he saw modernity. Other people saw something else. That, again, but everything that is done on this campus has some meaning and significance. And it is from the point of view of particular people. That's why when you ask me about defining the essence of Howard, it can't be done. There are essences, which doesn't make perfect sense, but uh, it does different things for different people. It addresses a whole universe of different kinds of problems. And it gives all of us associated with the university the opportunity to choose the problems we're working on, get the resources that we need for that, and proceed. Now, the implications of equality are slid over by some people. 
Now, uh, we will at some later time, I suppose, talk about Dr. Cheek. But President Cheek, who succeeded President Nabrit in 1969, Dr. Cheek was unimpressed by what had been built at Howard University. Uh, which of course offended me. I was Howard to my bones and I thought that his uh, uh, attitude was rather strange. But it wasn't strange. I came to find out that he really did mean that Howard should be in the top tier of American universities. He said that was his program. Dr. Johnson's program was clear. Mordecai Johnson had the goal of getting every college accredited, every school accredited. Uh, when he became president, uh, liberal arts and dentistry were the only two. And he wanted each school and college to be in a new building, what he called modern facility. So that was the program. Get them accredited, and all of that was, in, was implicated in that. Uh, that was done. Dr. Cheek had a different idea. He said, there are 3,000 degree granting institutions in the United States. There should be at least one identified with black people that is in the top tier. That's what he used as the language. He wasn't trying to imitate Ivy League schools, anything of the kind. He's, he's talking about resources and output. And so when he first became president, when he went before the Appropriations Committee of the House and the United States Senate, he asked to double, he asked them to double the Howard University budget. They turned him down flat, wouldn't give him a penny more than Dr. Nabrit's highest budget. He went back the second year, asked for double again, and he got it. Now, a part of that was persuasion. A part of it was something else. The persuasive part was we had, at the time he became president, 10 schools and colleges. And Dr. Cheek made a chart of institutions with medical schools that had the same program profile as Howard University. And then he had their budgets. And then he had the Howard budget. And he confronted people, said, explain this to me. He saw Secretary Elliot Richardson, who was the secretary of HEW, we had under HEW by that time. And Secretary Richardson said, I can see no reason other than racism. So, uh, and he had a list. First priority was faculty salaries. He said, our faculty salaries should be at the same point as a list of institutions with medical schools. And he, he chose the list. And Yale was on the list. The University of Chicago was on the list. Vanderbilt University was on the list, Duke, and some others. They had comparable student body sizes and so on. None of them were big state universities. And um, he looked at their facilities and said, not one of our facilities in comparable schools is comparable. And look at our faculty salaries. And so that began, and then he began acquiring real estate for this new enterprise. And that generated problems with the trustees. 
they told him, you're buying too much real estate. We don't need all that real estate. And some of the deans and faculty were saying, we don't need to be compared with all of those institutions. Now, they wanted the salaries. But uh, what do you mean our research output should be the same? We have a different mission. No. And you see, you can, you can go down the list. And that was a part of a 20-year effort that only partly succeeded. It was very partial. Because many people did not understand the point of that. Howard University is the best of the HBCUs. That's what they would say. Dr. Cheeks, I'm not talking about HBCUs. I'm talking about American institutions of higher education that are world class. And that's what we are supposed to be. And I was walking with him one day down the long walk. And we heard voices behind us. And someone said, that's mighty fancy stuff for Howard. They need, don't need that. And he spun around. You know, he was not a tall man. He spun around. His eyes were red. His neck had enlarged. This, this was a characteristic of him. When he got angry, he started flushing in the face and angry as he could be. He said, don't let me ever hear you say that again. There is nothing too good for the students and faculty of Howard University. Well, I have to tell you, he won me over 100% in that moment because I had, been a, I had been a skeptic and I had seen, you know, a whole, new things, new people coming in, and the old ways were being disregarded or discarded. But the new Howard he was talking about, though there were some major differences, in terms of ambition, were not different from those of General Howard. Because when Howard University was built, it was built in a comparable way to the leading universities of the country at the time. And again, you can only see that if you look at the others. So when, when I went to the University of California, there was North Hall and South Hall were still standing. They were 1868 buildings. And one of them looked exactly like Clark Hall did at Howard. And they had no building in the original University of California building in Berkeley that looked anything as grand as University Hall. So my point is that we, we uh, are a distinctive institution with complicated traditions, some of them contradictory, in fact. And to be successful in this enterprise takes everything a person has that they're willing to give. And I think that is the next evolutionary step for us. It's clear that when the new building program is underway, There will be a new Howard University. The question is, will there be the ambition and the enthusiasm to meet the vision implied by that? Dr. Winston, um, unfortunately, we're, we're running out of time. Yes. I was going to ask you about um, when you discussed the uh, building program in the night under Dr. President Johnson. I was going to ask you about 
the architect uh, Albert Cassell. Maybe I'll get your reflection on him on our next segment. But for now, I really, really would like to thank you, sir. Well, yeah. uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, I, I'm glad to uh, offer my point of view about uh, uh, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Nabrit and Dr. Cheek. Uh, it is not a majority view. Um, and my view of Howard is not a majority view. Uh, the pieces of it that people will yes. assent to. And as far as I'm concerned, that's fine. Yes. Because every student here, every faculty member, has a distinctive experience. That's part of the wonder of it all. And many of us really value that. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you. It's great to be invited. Thank you.